Ross, Reggie, finally we get to do a game. First two games, uh, national television. Finally, we get the band back together for our first local TV game. Austin, 7 o'clock, Fox 12 Plus. Look, but before every game, we have these big, long broadcast meetings where you guys give your thoughts on, on the upcoming game and, and what we've already seen. That All that information gets distilled down into like three and a half minutes that people see on television and what we call our open. I want to bring that discussion a little bit more expanded, kind of like what, what we say to each other on, on these broadcast calls, two games in, two draws. Ross, I'm going to start with you because you've been in Nashville being a dad. And so we haven't seen you. I'm surprised you're, you you're shaved you up. Tell. You have a haircut. That's good. All these things are good to see. We didn't know what are you going to look it's like. the freshest he's been for years. Wow. <laughs> incredible. I didn't, I didn't know there was a face underneath all their hair until today. <laughs> Man, what, what have you made? What have you made of the first two games? Uh, I, I love the way you've said it, by the way, for all that Liam and I said, all that it is worth is three minutes that go into the open is really what I heard from that. It's because you talk for an hour and then we're all sitting there falling asleep and it's like, right, okay, let's pick a little snipping out of what Ross has said. Rudy, wake up. This part's going to be good, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> what do I make? I, I think I look at it first and foremost and, and the Timbers, the, the schedule that they had with the two teams that they've played, they're difficult teams. New England Revolution, LAFC away. I mean, that's as two you would put them into the category of, of heavyweight teams and heavyweight given last year, what Bruce arena did with new England revolution, LAFC just over their course of, of time. I know it was disappointing last year, but Carlos Vela back, um, you know, they always carry a big ticket. So from the Timber standpoint coming in, I, I look at those results um, and I think they're very positive results in terms of what we've seen on the pitch. I think preseason, the first couple of games, you're always looking at how sharp are players how sharp are they fitness-wise? Uh, have they put the work in on the training ground? But not only that, Ridgie, I sometimes wonder, you, you can do the hard runs in preseason, but then guys might be um, carrying that a little bit coming into the season. Preseason is always meant to be difficult. And so players can can somewhat be leggy when they start the season because they've put in so much. I think the Timbers have looked very sharp. I think they've looked organized. And I know we're going to pick into a few particular players, but in general, they've been sharp. They've been organized. They looked like their collective group, which is impressive after two games. I'm just excited that the league have now pronounced big t the Timbers as a big ticket. It's finally, you know, a lot of people have not been putting a big ticket, but clearly, clearly they are because the first two games of the season, National take them off our hands and we uh, <laughs> we get demoted to doing the radio, I suppose, from uh, our normal TV gig. So uh, I think the Timbers have been prepared really well. Um, I alluded it to the start of the season. The players aren't really fit enough match fit until probably four games in. Um, you've still got to get your legs under you. Yeah, you can do as much training as you want uh, pre-season game, but they're still pre-season games. So I think they're doing very, very well. They're very organised, um, sticking to their tasks very well. well. Um, certainly with Zach and Bill, you know, changing over from Larice and Dario, who have obviously been injured. So I think they've worked really hard. Um, I think the next couple of games are probably going to be the ones where we will see the fitness levels and people start to come out of their shell a little bit and maybe create a bit more and, and things like that. But apart from that, I think the teams look very well, very solid, um, except for the, the last goal against LFC. Obviously, that they'll be you know massively disappointed with. Let's talk Zach McGraw. I mean, to me, that was the most intriguing player coming into this season. We knew uh, Dario and Larice had had offseason hernia surgery at the same time. We knew they were going to miss the first few games of the season. So you had six weeks, four weeks at least of this kind of run up of, OK, Zach McGraw is going to start next to Bill Tuiloma week one. We know what Bill can do, so there's no surprise there. But we didn't really know what Zach could do. 15 clearances against LAFC. I think he looks comfortable out there. He looks mm -hmm. like he belongs. As you guys who, who've who been there, who have played so many games at, at that position, what have you made of Zach? Uh, to me, I think he's looked very solid. You know, I'm, I'm sure Ross will probably, you know, say the same thing. I think he's looked very really solid. I think he's done what we expect him to do. He's a big boy. So we've mm -hmm. expected him to exert himself, show center, uh, center forwards what he's about. Um, be on the front foot and he did that in a, the sec, uh, second half in, in the New England game and he, he's done everything that he's needed to do now it's going forward now it's not being behind the ball and defending a lot it's now what passes can he make how can he open teams up from, from uh, his position and you know to Bill's case yeah we knew he could play but now he's had to go out as 
being a leader, you know, helping Zach along. You know, he's been playing with centre halves maybe that uh, have played more games than him, or maybe a bit more seen than him. And I think Bill showed that in abundance to be able to be, you know, a commanding figure back there, uh, someone that could help Zach out. Because that is difficult. Mm-hmm. Listen, when, you know, come into teams, Ross, how many times we, as youngsters, you come in with a, you know, we put him with a senior guy. Mm-hmm. They love to, some of them love to help you. Some of them love to hang you out to dry <laughs> and go, well, you know, crack on. You're going to do it yourself. You want my position, you're going to do it yourself. Yeah. Uh, so I think Bill's done that really well with Zach and, and Zach's thrived under it. I think that's one position on the pitch where it really does, is highlighted by how strong is the relationship rather than your two best individual center backs. Well, What's the relationship like for them? And that could be your, your number one and two choice based on that relationship. And to what you're saying with Bill and, and Zach, it looks like they've been playing together for years. Reggie, on the call, you talked about stepping in. And, you know, I, I love that. That was, <laughs> I, I don't know about you, Reggie. I was always one, I wanted to step in. I didn't want to go chasing him behind me. So I'd rather <laughs> no. step in, do, do five yards this way rather than 20 yards behind me. But to that, how they're in, in sequence. And it sounds pretty simple and you would say basic. But I'm amazed by how many players, and this wasn't included myself when, when I played until I had a senior pro behind, beside me, where you, you knew when to step in. It was a nice sequence. One steps in, the other covers behind, the other steps in. And to understand who's going tight and who's dropping. And I, I think, you know, in the most basic of sense, the way I explain that, I feel like Bill and Zach have been on the same page. When one steps in to go win a challenge, the other's covering and round, and it just flows nicely. And it sounds simple, but so important. Yeah, it's been fluid, certainly for them too. And, it, and to anyone watching the game, it should look like an, an arrow or a triangle. It should always be a point and two people in behind. Three people, if you count Van Rankin, if uh, on the other side with Bill going in and Bravo coming in. But it should always look like a V or a triangle with one person at the point. And that's been fluid. And I think we, we talked to Bill today uh, on, on Talk Timbers and he spoke about their relationship off the pitch. You know, two youngish boys hanging around, you know, I know Bill likes to go and play golf. I don't think Zach does. He may be too big for that, but <laughs> they, they hang around with each other. And I think that's shown onto the pitch and it's shown their relationship. And uh, to your point, Ross, it's, it's fluid. It's not forced. There's not uh, like a lag in it. It's fluid. And they, they know what they're doing. And, and Zach needs to do that. He's a big boy. And like I said, you, you alluded to it. I didn't want to run in behind. So it was either man or the ball, but not both together. <laughs> is, is that you going behind, but the man's not going. <laughs> one way you want to go. Wait, hold on. Go back quickly. Is that you putting out the invite saying, who's coming golf with, with me? And Bill's taking you up Blue on it. So Zach McGraw. Yeah, I just, I just go into training ground and see who's golfing nowadays. You know, I know Bill likes to go and golf, but Zach don't. So uh, we'll, we'll figure that out. It'll be fine. <laughs> one thing that, that's impressed me about Zach that maybe shouldn't be surprising at all is he he just looks really calm and assured out there, even when you go down a man, even in these these difficult environments. And yeah. he went to West Point. He, army right so he's a he's a he's an army west point grad and and you expect that kind of calmness and and that composure out of a guy who who was in that environment for four years and he doesn't look to be phased in what in a situation that maybe would phase you know a lot of people there's a lot of pressure you you know that this might be your chance right these two games might be your chance and if and if it doesn't work out you might go to the back of, of the depth chart again another center back might be brought in and it could not necessarily be it, but it could be harder to climb back up that ladder and get another chance in your career. And I'm he didn't see the army be... side to come out. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I think we'll see <laughs> it, right? He, I, he's a big guy. You don't want to mess with him, do you? No, that's right. No one's going up against him with that. <laughs> uh, that reminded me of the days with Kendall Waston. And, and I'd wait to see, is Nat Porters or Liam Ridgewell going to pick up Kendall Waston, the center back from Vancouver Whitecaps, yeah. coming up? He was a big boy. And I don't know if Zach McGraw fills out like Kendall Waston, but but certainly the size. Black yeah, Kendall, we used to be looking at each other. Me and Nat was like, fancy it? Uh, nah, okay. <laughs> on, you have him. We'll, we'll switch over. <laughs> Both of us, right, sweet. Let's get on each other's shoulders. We'll, we'll give it a go. I think that'd be, that'd be Zach in the future. <laughs> Jake, to that point real quick, I'm looking forward to, to bringing to the broadcast for those who haven't seen it. I sat with Zach, uh, I believe it was last year, just yeah. in the COVID world. I feel like everything meshes into to one another. It had to be last year with, with Zach. But um, to... Uh, to that with his stories from West Point and um, the training that he went through. He, he goes into it. I sit with him for about 20 minutes and uh, it's fascinating. So I look forward to bringing 
to it. But what stood out for me was his mental fortitude from it all. And I thought, geez, if you can withstand that, stepping <laughs> on the pitch at Providence Park, uh, you know, becoming a professional player in the most extreme circumstances, you're going to be all right when you get given that opportunity. And I already see him barking orders at other players, players who have more experience than him. He's wanting to pull them this way and organize them. So anyways, I think that all comes from a place where this is a guy who's very confident in himself, but a nice confidence. He's a, he's a very humble guy. He's, he's a nice guy, but he certainly has belief in himself and he certainly has the training to back it. Blocked eight field goals as a high school senior as well. Uh, so talk about the body and the ability. He, he could have gone and played football, American football, chose to play a different kind of football and seems to be the, the right decision, at least as of now. All right, let's 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 now move forward and and talk about the first two games of the season. We can't leave out Jimmy Chara to overhead kicks. Like, are, are we... Are we overhyping that? Is that, or you know, does he deserve all of the talk that that has been around on, on his on his two one you could call bicycle, the other an overhead, and, and what has been a sensational start to the season for Jimmy? He deserves it. Oh no, to, even to think about it. I'm like we said about <laughs> Dar- Dar- uh, like Spree is like your back, like just how you got that ability and agility to even do that. Just it's ridiculous, and I think he deserves that and more. And it's the it's the thought process into it. Like I say, a lot of people would take it down their chest and set it off for someone else to have a shot or bring it down and try and, you know, squirm a shot away themselves. But just to try the overhead kick and then both to come off. Most of the time they go in row Z. Most of the time they don't even go anywhere near the goal. But <laughs> both of them to to nestle in top corner side netting was incredible. I still The second one, I still think he's just trying to find an area. No, I just think he's trying to find an area. In the wow, goal. <laughs> you don't think he means to put that on goal? First, I've heard that. I think he means to put it in goal on goal, but from where it ends up, I just think he's just looking for oh. to look for the far post and not to go the way it goes. But I think he's just looking to put it into an area of that goal. You uh, into the goal? You don't think that? I he's still think to find he means to go into the goal. I'm not saying he's trying to find a pass, okay. but just the way it goes in top corner, top bins. Yeah was the the the, the uh, cherry on the cake yeah i just think he's <laughs> looking for an area in the goal not i'm not saying he's crossing it before everyone <laughs> jumps down my throat uh, so he's gonna shoot but he's just looking for an area rossi tippy yeah. tappy or no tippy tappy i mean <laughs> the tippy tappy that the def- definition is to do it with confidence and okay. that guy you know when you pull off the tricks and everything it was, it was terrific. And I'm sitting at, at home and and I'm looking for as many replays as possible to go on and watch it. But not only that, I mean, Jimmy Chara, he, he has really stood out. And I think for the Timbers, when you look back to their successful seasons, there's always been you know a couple of players where you say they're just on another level. I think Jimmy Chara right now for the first two games of the season, you're looking at him on another level. Uh, and another level since he's come in and, and put on the Timbers kit. The way he's he's getting out of a situation, he's looks sharp on sharp on the ball. He even took time going to left back and, and look good in the left back <laughs> position. But I wrote down it against LAFC. There was one moment in, in 15 minutes, and uh, he, he the way he took the ball down and he's gone past three players in his own half to to keep possession on the ball. So it's not only in front of goal what he's doing. It's not only the defensive end when he jumps in at left back to do a job, which is important for your your star man. It's everything in between as well. And then looking after the ball and getting more involved. Uh, I think that was my biggest, biggest criticism on it, on uh, Jimmy Charles since he's come in. That he'll show a flash and then he might not see him for 10, 15 minutes and then he'll show it again. Whereas I think he's been a lot more involved in these first two games. Seems like maybe... And that's that number 10 spot, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. I know Seba's obviously not, not, there. not there. I know that. Yeah. Like Seba, Seba is, is coming back in that number 10 spot. He's, he, you know, that that's right. But yeah. him moving inside, Suddenly he gets on the ball more. He suddenly he's creating more. I know Seba does drift out to wide and they do switch over in that fluid, you know, between. Aspria stays out wide a little bit more and he's an out, out ball. But them two switching. But J- Jimmy being in that middle 10 spot really has taken it with, with both hands and, and shows the creative, you know, it, is he in them positions if he's not playing the 10 spot for them two over kicks? Yeah. Is he still there yeah. or is he sort of setting that up or is he coming you know supporting play so that is real interesting i'm sure it's a big headache for Gio for when Sebo is re- really yeah. fit to come back in and a good one so what's what's your shape when you have felipe moore your knees go to spria um santi uh jimmy chara blanco 
I mean, and all I'm, of them. I, and, just stick them all in. <laughs> just, play, just, play, just play with one cent half. One, just one go. guy in the back. Just keep oh, going. Like, yeah, ten goals. <laughs> ten goals. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it'll be interesting. I think that's that'll be a big question mark going forward. And you know, so many years in MLS, I think right the way through the teams, that one of the biggest hits is the lack of depth. And I think you you're starting to do away with that with more money being invested, but also you have to be able to bring in the proper talent. And I think the Timbers right now, they, they have it. And it's from my time covering, it's potentially has the most depth in the attack that, that we've perhaps seen. I know 2015, uh, Richie, you'd have an argument and players that were dependable would do a job, but um, I think there's many different difference, difference makers in the team right now. I mean, you've got five yeah. potential starters not yeah. available to start at least yeah. Lloris, Dario, uh, Seba, Felipe, and, and Eric Williamson, yeah. who is working his way back, might be back soon, says he'll be back soon, though he's always, I think, been a little more ambitious than the technical staff wants him to be. We, we, you probably want him to be ambitious and wanting to come back, but the technical staff will rein him in and be more cautious about it. That's five guys who theoretically are starters in your best 11, not able to start the first two games of the year, and they're still putting out what looks like you know, a, a coherent MLS starting 11. I, mean, I think the difference with it is Jimmy playing, yeah, he's playing out on the left, but now he's coming to play on the, in the 10 role. And I look at the 2015 team. Rodney was an out-and-out left winger. Yeah. Lucas was an out-and-out right winger. So it was Espria. And we had Valeria in the 10. So it, it's you can't really shuffle that. It was always going to be difficult. You could put two up top. But with Jimmy being able to play that 10 role, Moreno coming in as well, great feet. He can work his way in that 10 role as well. But Jimmy now gives you another dynamic of like, well, Seba is maybe not up to speed. Maybe he's tiring a little bit. Jimmy can come in there and you know you've got a capable person to jump into that number 10 spot. And that's what Jimmy's done. He's proved that by coming in there and playing and scoring two great goals and being able to showcase his ability in there. So it gives that, to Ross's point, that depth, not necessarily on the bench. Yes, Luria can come in and go play left. You've got the depth on the bench, but you've also got the depth on the pitch that you can shuffle your pack as well. Speaking of of 15, one of those guys you could play with two up front is Maxi Arudi, who's now on Austin, yeah. who will be coming to Providence Park on Saturday night. Austin has dropped 10 goals oh. in its first five games. That's the most any team has ever scored in the first two games of the year. They did it against Cincinnati and Miami at home. It will be a different task at Providence Park. Are they for real? Is this like, is it just the opponents that they played or is this Austin team for real in its second year? Maxi, the pest. Seriously, <laughs> he's not going to let them. Yep. He's a pest. He's not going to give them a minute. Like Zach and Bill, that's what they're going to have to be ready for. He, they are not going to give him a minute. He will be running around, sliding, blocking, bumping, saying stuff. And even more at Providence Park, coming back to Timbers, he will be another 5%. And that's what the, certainly the back four have got to be ready for and up for the challenge. Because it won't be a big body up against them. Uh, they experienced that against New England. It will be someone that runs off them and, and just carries on throughout 90 minutes. He will not stop. He will play two games on, on Saturday <laughs> night. He will do two games and they've got to be ready for him to run around. And Jerusi underneath, he just needs, he just floats. You know, he just picks up the scraps, makes things happen and, and scores some great goals himself. So, you know, that's going to be the real telling point and making sure on the transition that the Timbers are really filled in their spots to make sure that the players can run everywhere they want to. But as long as they stay in their spots and keep to their their, their formation, uh, then they'll be OK. It's just when they get dragged out, uh, it can really hurt them. For me, they're, they're for real. I mean, with Josh Wolf and the three of us, we, we met with him last year. Mm-hmm. And I know all three of us, it was the consensus. consensus. We were so impressed by him. And, and despite Austin not going to be making the playoffs, Josh Wolf just had this confidence about him, this intelligence, though, uh, about what he was doing and, and the plan in place. And where I'm so impressed with them is that even though the results, they were hit or miss last year, some excitement when they played at home and some big results, um, but then it would fall by the wayside other times. But they always stuck to what, what they were, what they believed was their path. And this year, what's so impressive, there's been a, a change out. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Jakey, as, a, as I tighten up my notes this week, but 10 players have, have come in. But it's 10 players who can 
can do a job and continue to progress the team down their path. It's not as though they need yeah. to all of a sudden change their direction. Whereas you look like an inter Miami, all of a sudden it's just a, a massive overhaul of players because they have to change. They have to change their identity. It seems that's obviously from the outside perspective. So what they've done, they've come in, um, they, they know where they want to get to. They've stuck to it and it's impressive. And it's not easy to do when you look at expansion teams coming in and, and they want to have success right away. I think Austin FC were, were happy with the, the the success from last year in glimpses to what they've seen, and they just built off of that. And I think behind it all, behind the curtain, is, is Josh Wolf pulling the levers, and it's a guy who's really intelligent, who's getting the most out of his players. He works his tail off, but I think tactically he's got something different. And the recruitment, when Richie yeah. mentions Drew uh, the recruitment yeah. as well, everything's falling into place. So that's why, for me, um, they're, they're for real. And – when you look at the midfield, I think on on uh, Saturday, they're one of the strongest midfield in the league. And I don't think it's their strongest midfield just yet because they brought in a player, Valencia, who I think will push for a starting role. But Alexander Ring used to play at New York City FC is there. And and Sebastian Driussi, um, you know, they've got one of the most formidable and talented midfielders in the league, in my opinion. I think that recruitment is the, the – and it sounds simple, but they've recruited players in the positions – that they want. I know it sounds absolutely crazy and so simple, but they've gone out and gone, right, we need, and I, I've, I'm going to point to it again and again and again, defensive-minded people to not worry about attacking, to worry about the transition of when they lose the ball. They've added a centre-half and they've added a midfielder, uh, a couple of midfielders actually, and who can handle that and give them that stability when they are attacking. The attacking players, they will stay up. They're flair players. They're allowed to do it. They get away with it. Well done. <laughs> it's the defenders and the defending thinking people that will then keep them goals going in their own net and allows them to win, you know, 5-0, five 5-1. Five you know, that's what's allowing them to do that. And it, that's going to be the re- really biggest telling point for me when they come to Providence Park on Saturday night. You know, guys, we got to save something for the broadcast. Great to catch up. <laughs> I've done all my notes. That's it. I'm, I'm done. We can just, we can just put this 7 o'clock just Seriously. to play. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to stand there in a suit. I'm just going to be a silhouette and just go, just smile. That's it. I've got nothing else. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we normally can't... see, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> oh, can't wait to be back in the booth with you guys. Seven o'clock, Timbers, Austin FC, Fox 12 Plus. Let's do it.